It happened in Canterbury, England, eight centuries ago. A story as ageless as time itself. The immortal story of a man called Beckett. At the west end of the martyrdom is a door that separates the world of the monks from that of the public. It's the entrance to the great cloister and it's well worth a visit. Following an earthquake in the 1380s, the whole of the south nave and cloisters were refashioned in the late 1300s and early 1400s. The cloister was the main road of the monastery connecting all the major buildings with the church. It had been on its present site since the earliest days of the monastery. The elaborate door that leads into the martyrdom was especially revered in the medieval times and King Edward I was married here in 1299. The 15th century renovation of the cloisters builds right through the original 11th century door surround. The south facing cloister was where the monks did the majority of their work. But look at the seating, some very bored novices have made holes where they played marbles. The cloisters were designed by the king's master mason, Henry Everly, and built by his successor, Stephen Lott. It's only when you look up at the amazing bosses and the stone weaved like spider's gossamer that you start to really understand their genius. The ceiling is a riot of writhing images, grotesque portraits, scenes from medieval life and natural objects. It's wonderful in its absurdity. Hairy men wrestling bulls. Hairy men lancing a wild boar. And hiding in the panoply of the absurd, an homage to the designer. Henry Evelry. And perhaps also to the builder, Stephen Lott. Then the money ran out. <laughs> Then it all gets a little bit more corporate. What you're looking at is a medieval version of corporate sponsorship. Richard the Lionheart had introduced coats of arms and they were taken up enthusiastically by the leading families of England. The enterprising prior of the monastery had found a new way of raising funds for a price, your family's coat of arms could be immortalised in stone in the Mother Church of England. With business organisations such as the Sank Port also giving money to the cathedral for their coats of arms to be displayed, could this be the first example of corporate sponsorship? The ceiling bosses certainly become less interesting and less exciting. At the end of the south walk of the cloister is the doorway to the Archbishop's Palace and importantly on the right, that to the Cellarman's lodgings. He makes the beer. What today is the Archdeacon's garden was the refectory, the main dining hall for the monastery. At the end of the south walk is the cellarer's doorway and a strange hole. This is where you'd put your mug to receive beer, and good times could be had by all. At the northeast corner of the cloister is a small door, which allowed the monks to return to the dormitory unnoticed. Next to the doorway to dark entry stands the chapter house. The chapter house is the most complete building to survive from the destruction of the monastery. It's a huge hall, nearly 100 feet long and covered by a splendid latticework roof made of bog oak. The roof dates from 1400, but the building dates back at least to the early 1300s and stands on the site of the Norman chapter house of about 1080. At the far end, you can still see the grand throne used by the prior as head of the house and all around the walls are low stone seats on which the 150 monks used to sit. 
and finally the slight door used to move seamlessly around the monastery. <laughs> 